Story 1. This is a story that happened to me, my family, and some of our neighbors a while back. To give some backstory, we live in a rather nice neighborhood. The people in it aren't very well off, to be sure, but there are a couple of nice neighborhood parks around where we live. On one particular Saturday afternoon, me, my wife, and our two-year-old son went to one of the parks. While our son, who I'll call Matt for purposes of the story, played on the playscape, my wife and I sat at one of the nearby picnic tables talking. A little while later, another family showed up. I was good friends with the father, who I'll refer to as Dan, and he and his wife joined our discussion. After another 15 minutes or so, our son was getting bored of playing on the playscape, and asked if he could explore the nearby retention pond. It was technically part of the park, as in the bottom had several chain-length fence segments with trash cans nearby so that people could use it to play baseball and softball. After checking with my wife, I started walking to the area with Matt. As it hadn't rained in a while, it was completely dry. The sides of the area were rather steep, so Matt and I took our time getting down to the bottom. Once there, we chased each other around for a bit, and Matt tried and failed to climb the chain link fence. After another few minutes, we were about ready to walk back up, when my son pointed to one side of the field and asked if we could go over there. I looked over and saw a tunnel under a road that ran along one side of the retention pond area. I hadn't actually noticed it before, or else I didn't remember. I assumed it was to let water through to a similar area on the other side, but it was also big enough to perhaps be designed as a walkway. I debated about whether to check with my wife first, but ultimately we just walked over. The tunnel was made of concrete and was rectangular, about six feet high and eight feet wide with a slab of concrete dividing it down the middle. I looked inside of it and it appeared to be about 40 feet to the other side. The insides had graffiti on them, but otherwise the tunnel looked clean and dry, at least as clean as a concrete tunnel under a road could be, so I decided it was okay to walk through it. Matt and I decided to split up and meet each other at the other side. We did just that, and while walking through the tunnel we shouted and clapped our hands to hear the echoes. A minute later we met on the other side and decided to explore the area a bit, which indeed seemed to be an extension of the park since there were more picnic tables. After another minute or so we walked back to the tunnel. We decided to switch sides and meet each other at the other end again. As we walked back through I noticed an entrance to a large concrete pipe about halfway through the tunnel. I felt a tiny bit afraid since I didn't realize that before my son walked down that side before. There was a fair amount of light coming from either side of the tunnel, so I tried to squint and look down the pipe, but I couldn't see anything. There didn't appear to be any sunlight coming through the other end of the pipe at least. Eventually we made our way back to the playscape where my wife and Dan's wife were still talking at the picnic tables. Dan was with his two kids on the playscape. My wife asked us if we had fun, and Matt enthusiastically said yes, while he proceeded to explain some of the things we did. When he mentioned going through the tunnels and seeing the pipe, my wife's expression changed to show a bit of concern and annoyance. She told us to be careful in the future and not to go back through the tunnel. I agreed and told her we wouldn't go through there again. Dan overheard our conversation and mentioned that his kids had seen the tunnel before and asked us if it was clean and dry inside. Apparently he was intrigued as well, though his wife shot him a glance of annoyance just as mine did. I told him it was tall and wide enough to walk through and about 40 feet from one end to the other. I also told him that I tried looking through the pipe but couldn't see anything. Dan then suggested that we use both of our flashlights and see if there was anything in the tunnel. Over the slight disapproval of our wives, we decided to check it out out of pure curiosity. Once we made our way down to the entrance of the tunnel, Dan and I turned both of our phones on and walked inside. As we reached the pipe, we quieted down to listen. We couldn't hear anything aside from the wind blowing gently through the trees on the other side of the tunnel. Next, we shined both of our flashlights into the pipe. At first, I was confused, because it seemed like our lights weren't hitting anything, not even the sides of the pipe further down. After a few seconds it dawned on us that there was a black curtain-like object concealing the rest of the pipe. When that sank in, it sent chills up my spine, but nothing could prepare either of us for what happened next. 
For the next couple seconds, Dan and I just stood there, not saying a word. Then suddenly, we noticed movement, and the bottom of the curtain opened up to display a disgusting face. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I felt my heart sink into my stomach. The face appeared to belong to a man in his 40s or 50s with gross, wiry hair. His face was contorted into a very unsettling smirk, and his eyes looked crazy and terrifying. There's just no other way to describe it. Dan and I both screamed and then ran back out of the tunnel. We ran across the bottom of the retention pond and back up the side of the, of the playground. Our wives immediately took notice and asked us what happened. And when we told them what we saw, they called our kids over and we all rushed home. Before we parted ways, I told Dan that I'd call the cops when we got back to our house. And I did just that. After explaining the situation, they sent a squad car over and two police officers investigated. Afterwards, they came to our house to ask us some questions, and they told us that they checked out the pipe but didn't find anything in there except some garbage. As far as we and they knew, there weren't any other reports of a suspicious person in the area, and our suburban city doesn't have hardly any homeless people. I certainly had never seen any in our neighborhood before. The police told us that they'd probably check the area periodically, and a few weeks later the city actually put up a grate to block the pipe though it was still possible to walk through the tunnel from end to end. Needless to say, my wife and I were reluctant to take our son back there, but about two months later we finally went back. I never saw that disgusting man again, but it still stands as one of the most horrifying moments of my life. Story 2 I'll start off by saying that I visit parks and go for short hikes regularly. I'm definitely not what you'd call an outdoorsy type. I just enjoy getting some air and clearing my head on the weekends, and sometimes on evenings after work. On one particular Thursday evening, I was walking through one of the state parks relatively close to where I live, just taking in nature and admiring the fall foliage. To avoid giving this park a bad name, I won't mention which one it is, though I will say that I live in Massachusetts. It really isn't relevant to the story though. In this particular park, there is a small river with multiple small waterfalls and several wider areas where people can swim. I've also seen people fish there. The main walking trail is an asphalt trail that loops around most of the park and hugs the river on that side. I'd say it's about five miles altogether. In one spot by the river, there's a lot of picnic tables and iron grills that people can use if they bring their own charcoal. This area also has a canopy formed by a lot of big trees and with the leaves turning different colors and falling off in the evening sunlight, it was rather breathtaking. As I walked through this area just admiring the scenery, I caught a glimpse of someone sitting at one of the picnic tables. When I saw him, I jumped a little, as I hadn't noticed him before. I assumed he had just been sitting there, as I thought I would have noticed him if he had been walking through the leaves. To paint a picture, he looked like he was maybe in his 50s, rather average looking, though he did have a completely blank expression which was unnerving. He had on a big black coat, as well as baggy blue jeans, which were ripped over the knees, as well as black boots and a red beanie. I found it a bit odd that he was wearing a coat, as it was really nice outside. He was sitting at one of the picnic tables, about 30 feet away from the trail, and a little ahead of me. After my initial reaction, I had decided just to keep walking, and I was thinking about whether or not I should try to make eye contact or say anything. That's when I noticed he was looking right at me as I was walking towards him. I felt my stomach tightening up and the hairs on my back standing on end. Though I didn't want to, at this point I figured it would be best to keep walking and to make eye contact and say something to give the impression that I wasn't intimidated by him. As I walked by, he was still watching me, though he wasn't saying anything. My mouth seemed incredibly dry as I looked at him gave a very small wave, and tried my best to conceal my fear as I said hello quietly. He still didn't say anything, and the sensation in my stomach got even stronger. I picked up the pace as I walked away, and I felt another pang in my stomach as it dawned on me that he wasn't actually using the picnic table. He was just sitting there, without eating or drinking anything. I tried to turn my head and look back periodically without making it obvious. And each time I did, I felt another stab in my gut as he was still looking directly at me. At this point, I was completely sketched out, and I was almost jogging. 
though I tried to maintain a walking pace so as not to make it seem like I was afraid. Eventually, I came to the point in the trail where it turned away from the river and curved around another part of the park. As I looked back one last time, to my horror, I found that he was no longer sitting at the table. He was completely gone. I froze in my tracks, and my eyes instinctively searched the picnic tables, trees, and the bushes nearby. He wasn't anywhere I could find. At that moment, I had a decision. I could go back the way I just came, which was the fastest way to get to my car, or I could continue on the trail which would eventually loop back and take me to my car. I estimated that it would be another two miles or so to get back, as the main parking lots could be accessed from either of two opposite sides of the loop where the trail came closer together. There were also the park offices at the main entrance, and I figured that I could report a suspicious man near the picnic tables, and maybe one of the park rangers could even drive me back to my car. I made my decision to keep going forward, and turned my brisk walk into a jog. As I made my way down the trail, Paranoia started taking over as I thought I kept hearing the sound of someone in the leaves off to one side of the trail. There was thick brush on either side, and I was terrified thinking that he would just pop out at me at some point. My jog turned into a run. Eventually the small wooden building of the park came into view, and I felt like a weight had just been lifted off my shoulders. As I caught my breath and walked up to the building, however, my sense of relief vanished as I realized that it was after 5 p.m and the rangers had all gone home. There was a small parking lot there, which was now completely empty. I noticed that the bathrooms were still open, and for a brief second I contemplated about whether or not to hide out in one of them, lock it from the inside, and call the cops. Ultimately I decided against it, I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe I didn't want to bother the cops, or I thought they wouldn't believe me. For whatever reason, I decided to keep walking back to my car which was only about a quarter mile away now. The office was by the main entrance, and a short road connected it to the main parking lots in the middle of the park. I just had to walk down this road to get to my car. I decided to do a 360 and check to see if the man was anywhere at or near the office, and when I didn't find him, I started jogging again down the road to the parking lot. Finally, my car came into view and I again felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. But nothing could really prepare me for what was about to happen. I was maybe a hundred feet away from my car when I saw something further down in the adjacent parking lot. It was a blue sedan. I assumed either from the man or another hiker in the park. After another few seconds, that's when I noticed him. It was that same man from the picnic tables, standing about 20 feet away from the car eyes locked on me and not saying a word. This time I didn't even stop to think. I just started booking it to my car. To my absolute horror, the man broke into a sprint as well. As I ran, I used the keyless entry to open my car and my heart pounded as I threw open the door and then got inside and locked it. My life flashed before my eyes and my hands trembled as I shoved the key in the ignition and turned it. In the corner of my eye, I saw the man standing about 10 feet away from my car on the driver's side which was the side he had been on. Apparently, he had decided to stop when he realized I would make it to my car. I didn't care. I backed up, threw it in drive, and slammed my foot down as I went back out of the park. After that, I drove to a shopping center about five miles away, all the while checking my rearview mirror for that blue sedan. I pulled into the shopping center and parked in a parking lot on the other side, out of view from the main road. I dialed 911 and, almost still out of breath, explained the situation. I told him there was a crazy man who had been watching me and then ran at me when I was going to my car. I also told them where I had parked and that I wasn't sure but I didn't think I was followed. About 20 minutes later I saw a cop car pull around the side of the shopping center and I waved them over. At last I felt relieved. The officer informed me that several other officers were searching the park now and after asking me some questions he offered to escort me back to where I lived. I graciously accepted his offer, and after another 15 minutes or so, I pulled into my driveway. I made sure to close the garage door and double check all of my doors. Needless to say, not that much sleep was had that night, but luckily I never saw that man again, though I also haven't gone back to that park. And if I ever do go back, it'll be with a friend or two, and only when it's busy. 
Story 3 This happened to me in the fall of 2015, while I was visiting a state park in northern Indiana. I have a somewhat stressful job, so I'd always try to get out on weekends. The park wasn't too far from where I lived. I usually would go there in the morning, hike around the trails for a few hours, go back to my car and eat the food that I brought, and then maybe hike for two more hours or so. This particular day was a Saturday, and it was pleasant out, not too hot and not too cold. The foliage was also pretty, which was another plus. The day started off normal, and around 9am I made my way onto the first trail. I must have hiked for a good hour, just taking in the scenery and the fresh fall air. That was when I spotted him, or actually, when I just realized he was there. While walking, I heard the sound of footsteps about 50 feet behind me, accompanied by heavy breathing. I turned my hand to see a very large man in a t-shirt and athletic shorts heading in my direction. His head was down, so I couldn't get a good look at his face, but he had longer hair and a beard. Now I'm not one to put people down for their appearance, as I've put on a few pounds before. But what struck me as odd was the fact that the man had to be at least 300 pounds, but was hiking through the forest. I assumed that he must have been trying to lose weight, but in any case it just seemed out of place. I continued walking, expecting to put more distance between us, and I did to an extent, but about five minutes later I turned around and I still saw him in my field of view. He was still looking down at the ground, which for some reason seemed unusual. At this point, I wasn't creeped out, but rather annoyed. I knew there'd be a branch less than a mile up the trail, and I planned to somehow take the side that he didn't take. I debated about what to do, and ultimately I decided to stop near the junction, take a look at the map that was there, though I already knew what it said, and wait for him to pass by. About 10 minutes later, I reached the fork in the trail, and at that point the man was about 50 feet behind me again. I guess he had picked up the pace a little, and he seemed noticeably out of breath. Just like I planned, I walked up to the map and looked down and around at the different features, pretending that I didn't know where the trails led. A few moments later the man walked up, but to my annoyance he slowed down instead of choosing one path to go down. I then realized that he may have wanted to look at the map. I think at this point I turned towards him and backed away from the map a bit, and said something like, here, take a look but I stopped mid-sentence. The man was closer to me than I expected. He was only like five feet away. He was also still looking down, and I noticed a very unpleasant odor coming off him. His clothes were stained and didn't appear to have been washed any time recently. I walked a few more feet away from the map, expecting him to go up to it and look, but he just stood there. At this point, things were really awkward, and I considered just walking back the way I came. I didn't though, because I got the strange feeling that he would just start following me back. Finally, after what seemed like 10 minutes, but was probably more like 20, I asked him if he wanted to take a look at the map. For the first time since I saw him, he turned his face up, allowing me to get a good look at it, and I almost flinched with what I saw. The first thing I noticed was his eyes, which seemed to be glassed over and looking at something far off into the distance. He also had a blank expression, and his beard looked very ragged. I don't think my description does it justice, I guess you just had to be there in that moment. This is where I started to get creeped out, and from this point on, I kinda just wanted to go back to my car. He still didn't move after that, and he seemed to be looking right at me even though his eyes appeared to be fixed far in the distance. Finally I said to him, hey, are you lost? Still he didn't say anything. It occurred to me that he might have a mental disability, which made me feel a bit concerned and also a bit safer for some reason. My brother has a mental disability, so I felt bad for this man, and I was actually concerned that he may have some problem getting back to wherever he parked. Still, the situation was very strange and uncomfortable. Almost without warning, he turned his head back down to the ground and started walking down the trail to the left. I stood there for a minute, trying to process what just happened, before finally deciding to just go back the way I came and back to my car. After I started walking back, I also decided to talk to someone at the park office and tell them that one of the visitors I came across on the trail was acting a bit strange. 
To be honest, I was a bit conflicted, and part of me wanted to find the man and try to get him to come back with me so that nothing bad would happen to him. But I also figured that since he had found his way onto the trail, and it seemed like he had enough food to eat, that he must have been taken care of somehow. Though with the state his clothes were in, I was a bit conflicted about that as well. Fifteen minutes must have passed, and I was starting to enjoy the hike again, when something made me instinctively check behind myself. My heart nearly sank into my stomach as I saw that same man about a hundred feet away. I don't know if I had heard something or not, but all I did know was that now the man wasn't just staring down at the ground, he was looking up at me. He still had that completely blank expression on his face. I didn't panic just yet, and I didn't feel too threatened because I felt like I could easily outrun him or overpower him. I also thought it was completely possible that he just decided to come back, perhaps because he was getting tired. It wasn't super hot outside at this time, but it was getting a little warmer. Whatever the case, with the man now looking at me, I decided to walk a bit faster. Another 30 seconds or so later, that was the first time I heard it. It was a noise kind of like a yell and a meow, there's no other way I could describe it. I looked back at the man, who was now 50 feet behind me, but that wasn't the scariest part. His mouth was wide open, and his arms were outstretched to the side. I was officially freaked out, and I started jogging. It was about two miles back to my car on level ground, and I knew I'd be cutting this trip short then and there. He made the sound again, and this time I jumped and started running. I checked over my shoulder and I saw him in the same position as before, still 50 feet behind me, which meant he was speeding up. I almost didn't know how, given his weight, but I didn't care. I just kept running, periodically checking over my shoulder, and after another minute or so, he disappeared from my field of view. I eased up a bit on the pace, but still ran all the way to my car. I unlocked it and quickly got inside. I figured that I had to have put a good amount of distance between us, but that didn't stop my mind from imagining that he'd jump out at me any second from the trailhead. I almost considered just driving off right there, but I thought it would be best to warn the park staff that there was a mentally unstable man on the trails. After driving the short distance back to the front of the park, I parked my car in the small lot near the building and walked inside. I explained the situation to the two girls working in the office slash gift shop, and I also told them about the man's physical appearance. They both appeared concerned, and also said that no one who came in that day matched his description. They decided to call the cops, and two officers showed up about 15 minutes later. They had me give a statement, and I relayed what had just transpired. I think they were planning to sweep the trails, or at least drive around and check a few spots. I don't really know what exactly they did. I drove home right after I talked to them. For a good couple nights, I found it harder to get some sleep, but after a while it was okay. It actually turned into kind of a good story I could share. Obviously I didn't go back to the park right away, I think it was a good couple of months. But when I did go back the next time, I asked the guy and lady in the office if they knew anything related to that man. The lady, who wasn't either one of the ones I talked to that day, had no idea. The guy told me he heard about it, but didn't know anything else that happened. I thanked them and went on my way, and because it was colder out, I thought it was unlikely that that guy would even come back to the trails. I guess I still imagined he'd be wearing his shorts and t-shirt. Though I was a bit nervous, I actually had a good time hiking that day. I never saw that man again, and I've been to the park a bunch of times over the years. Even so, that had to be the freakiest thing that's happened to me in my life so far. I also wonder where that man could have come from, since he hadn't come into the office that day. I figured that he was either someone's passenger, or maybe he even called an Uber and got out close to the park entrance. Either way though, I'm just glad that I haven't run into him ever again. <laughs>